All right, so this is the first part for the respiratory system, chapter 22, or maybe another chapter, depending on the edition and the, the book that you're using. When we look at the respiratory system, the major function for a respiratory system is to bring in oxygen for the body in order for the production of ener energy, for ATP we're talking about, in cellular respiration. And one of the waste products of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide. So respiratory system is trying to bring in oxygen and remove carbon dioxide. In order for the cells of our body to be able to produce ATP, it needs oxygen. And in order for that oxygen to get to those cells, it needs blood, specifically red blood cells, to carry over the oxygen to them. So the circulatory system is moving the blood around. And when the blood gets to the respiratory system, it will at that point remove the carbon dioxide that was produced by the cells. And also it will take in oxygen from the atmosphere and then deliver it to the cells. And this occurs in a closed loop. So both the respiratory system and the circulatory system, they're closely coupled. Because the respiratory system moves air, it's also involved with the sense of smell as well as speech. Respiration involves four processes. Pulmonary ventilation, external respiration, transport of oxygen carbon dioxide, and internal respiration. The first one, pulmonary ventilation, or in other words, we also call this breathing, consists of inspiration and expiration. In other words, inspiration is moving air into the lungs from the atmosphere, and expiration is moving air out of the lungs and into the atmosphere. The next thing we have is external respiration. This is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the lungs and blood. So we have oxygen that leaves the lungs and enters the blood, and we have carbon dioxide that's leaving the blood and entering the lungs. Third, we have transport. This is a transitory of the respiratory gases, again, being oxygen and carbon dioxide. Uh, so the cardiovascular system transports these gases using blood as a transporting fluid. Finally, for internal respiration, internal respiration, we're talking about oxygen diffusing from the blood to the tissues and carbon dioxide diffusing from the tissue to blood. So internal respiration, this, these is the gases being exchanged between blood and tissue. The nose provides an area for respiration. It moistens and warms the entering air. It filters and cleans out the inspired air. And it also serves as a resonating chamber for speech. In addition to that, it also houses the olfactory receptors. So olfactory receptors, another term for that, uh, are just your, again, um, think of them as your smell receptors. These are the organs that are used for, uh, for smelling. So after the nose and nasal cavity, we have our paranasal sinuses. The paranasal sinuses, they help decrease the weight of our skull. In addition to that, they also help resonate our voice. When you go below that, we have the pharynx. The pharynx, more commonly, this is our throat. Below this level, we have our larynx. And larynx is where we have, um, where our voice is produced, sound gets produced over here. When we go below the level of the larynx, we come to the trachea. The trachea is the main tube that divides into smaller branches, which are called the bronchial tree. From there, these will penetrate into the lungs and going all the way down to the very small sacs where the actual gas exchange takes place, which are called the alveoli. So when you look over here, we have upper respiratory and lower respiratory. So if you've ever been sick, you've had a flu or you've had an infection, the doctor may have said you have an upper respiratory tract infection or th the doctor may have said you have a lower respiratory tract infection. So upper respiratory tract infections, they involve everything up to the level of the pharynx. And if you have a lower respiratory tract infection, that starts at the larynx and goes all the way down into the lungs, into the alveoli. So below pharynx, that's all lower respiratory. At the pharynx and above, upper respiratory. So when we look at this uh, image over here, 
we have the nostrils, and as we go above the nostrils, this is the nasal cavity, and as we move posterior and then start to, to move inferior, we go down into the throat area, which is the pharynx. From there, there's two possibilities. There's two routes. If you look over here, there's a route that kind of goes back that, this way, and then also there's a right route that comes to the front over here. So if you end up going back this way, you're going into your food tube, which is called the esophagus, and that ends up going to the stomach. And the anterior part, if you move anteriorly, then you're going to be coming into your uh, voice box. Okay? Or again, this is uh, our larynx. And then from here, you end up going down into this main uh, trachea. From there, you end up having the divisions of the trachea. You have a right and left primary bronchus. And then from there, we have end up having small and small branches that end up going all the way down into the little sacs called the alveoli. And we'll be looking at that uh, in the slides, a uh, handful of slides later in this lecture. So the other thing that you, if you notice over here, the left lung, it's slightly smaller than the right lung. So one of the things that you want to notice is that the left lung has two lobes, whereas the right lung has three lobes. And the reason for that is that the apex of the heart, it sits more towards the, the, uh, the left side of the body than it does the right, so it kind of takes room into the, into the left, uh, the area where the left lung is. So this little cutout that you see over here, uh, this is uh, where you're going to have the heart, the apex of the heart that comes and sits against it. So this is the first table, 22.1, and it just goes over some of the things that we spoke about. The, it goes over the structure, description, and general uh, and distinctive features, and then the function. So I'm not going to go over each one of these things. You're, you're free to read it in the book or look at the, the PowerPoint. Or uh, if you want, you can just pause this video and look at it. And here's the next one, table 22.2. It goes over more, uh, some of the, more, more of the structures, that, uh, some of them of which we've uh, discussed. And we move on to the nose and perinasal sinus. So I kind of talked about it, uh, about these a little bit. So again, the nose, it provides an airway for respiration to take place. When we breathe in air, that air gets moistened and it also gets warmed up um, as it moves through some of the membranes that, that, uh, that line our nasal cavity. In addition to that, before that air gets to the alveoli where the, uh, the gas exchange is going to be taking place, not only is it warming up, that air getting warmed up and moistened, but it, it's also being filtered and cleaned before it, go, it goes down into the alveoli. Aside from that, uh, your nose also serves as a resonating chamber for speech. And as I said earlier, it also houses receptors that allow us the ability to smell different different odors, whether it's good or, or, or something that we don't like uh, or bad. So there's two distinct regions that uh, the nose gets divided into. We have our external nose, and then there's a nasal cavity. Of course, the external nose is everything, that, everything that's on the outside. And this, the, the parts that are inside or are internal are found within that nasal cavity. As for the external nose, the ears include the following. So the area between the eyebrow is called the root. We have the bridge, and then this is the, the dorsum nasi, which is the, also known as the anterior margin. Then finally, we have the apex of the nose. That's the tip of your nose. So the nasal bone forms the, the bridge, and the root is formed by the frontal bone. When we go lateral, we have our maxillary bones both sides laterally. And then finally, uh, the plates of hyaline cartilage, they form inferiorly over here. And this is all hyaline cartilage over here that, uh, that make up the, uh, uh, the, the alar tissue, the alar cartilages that we have. During breathing, air enters the cavity by passing through the nostrils, or another term that's used are the nares. The nasal septum, it's formed anteriorly by the septal cartilage and posteriorly 
by the vomer bone and perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. The nasal cavity is continuous posteriorly with the nasal portion of the pharynx through the posterior nasal apertures, which are also called the cone. Cone transfers or translates into funnel-like. So again, it's, it has somewhat of a funnel-like shape. The roof of the nasal cavity is formed by the ethmoid and sphenoid bones of the skull. The floor is formed by the palate, which separates the nasal cavity from the oral cavity below. The heart palate is found anteriorly, where the palate is supported by the palatine bones and processes of the maxillary bones. The muscular soft palate is the unsupported posterior portion. The part of the nasal cavity superior to each nostril is called the nasal vestibule. It's lined with skin containing sebaceous and sweat glands in addition to hair follicles. We call these follicles vibrissae. And their job is to clean up the air, whatever uh, particles or dust or other contaminants might be in the air, they kind of help pick them off. The remainder of the nasal cavity ends up being lined with two types of mucous membranes. First, we have the olfactory mucosa, which lines the superior region of the nasal cavity, and it contains smell receptors in its olfactory epithelium. Next, we have the respiratory mucosa. The respiratory mucosa lines most of the nasal cavity. The respiratory mucosa is made up of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, which also has goblet cells scattered within the tissue. It rests on a laminar propria that's richly supplied with ceramucous nasal glands. Ceramucous nasal glands contain mucus secreting mucus cells and serous cells that secrete a watery fluid containing enzymes. Every day, these glands secrete about a liter of mucus containing lysosome, which is an antibacterial enzyme. The epithelial cells of the respiratory mucosa also secretes defensin. Defensin is a natural antibiotic that helps kill invading microbes. The sticky mucus traps inspired dust, bacteria, and other debris, while lysosomes attack and chemically destroy bacteria. Additionally, the high water content of the mucus film humidifies the incoming air. The ciliated cells of the respiratory mucosa creates a gentle current that moves the sheet of contaminated mucus posteriorly towards the throat where it's swallowed and digested. The nasal mucosa is richly supplied with sensory nerve endings and contact with irritating particles such as dust, pollen, or any other irritant triggers the sneeze reflex. The sneeze forces air outwards in a violent burst. It's a crude but effective way to expel irritants. Extending medially from each lateral wall of the nasal cavity are three scroll-like mucosa-covered projections, the superior, middle, and inferior conche. The groove inferior to each conche is called the nasal meatus. The shape of each conche helps to increase the mucosal area as well as it enhances the air turbulence, in other words, the force of the air as it moves through. As for the functions of the conche, the gases in inhaled air swirl through the twists and turns, deflecting heavier non-gaseous particles onto the mucous coated surfaces where they become trapped. As a result, few particles larger than 6 micrometers make it past the nasal cavity. Now during inhalation, the conche function to filter heat and moisten the air. And during exhalation, they reclaim this heat and moisture. In other words, inspired air cools the conche. Then during exhalation, these cooled conche precipitate moisture and extract heat from the humid air flowing over them. What more is that these alternating events minimizes the amount of moisture and heat that's lost from the body through breathing. This helps us to survive in dry and cold climates. The nasal cavity is surrounded by a ring of paranasal sinuses. They're located in the frontal, sphenoid, ethmoid, and maxillary bones. The sinuses lighten the skull, 
in addition to helping warm up and moisten the air. The mucus they produce flows into the nasal cavity and the suctioning effect created by nose blowing helps drain the sinuses. It also acts as a resonating chamber in phonation. So when you look over here, you can see your frontal sinus. Again, it's located behind the frontal bone. Here's a sphenoid bone. You can see part of the wing. And uh, so here's the sphenoidal sinus. Uh, over here, you can see the posterior, posterior nasal aperture. Now these over here, oh, let's go back over here. So this is, this is the superior, this is the middle, and here's the inferior nasal concave. Now the spaces between them over here, these are the meatuses. So again, you have your superior, middle, and inferior nasal meatus. And this is your, the openings, that's your nostril. Here's the nasal vestibules over here. This, the, this first corridor, if you would like, uh, to look at it that way. That's gonna be the nasal vestibule over here. And as we go back over here, we're gonna be looking at this structure. This is the uvula. So. Um, if you open your mouth and you see that little thing that's hanging, ba hanging back there, that's what this is. That's your uvula. And it's not sure what this is, us, is when you take and digest any type of food or liquid, this prevents that food or liquid from going up and into your nose. So this actually helps direct, if you look at the shape of it, it helps kind of push the food downwards okay, and into your, well, your food pipe, hopefully. So again, that's going to be your esophagus. And here's another photograph that shows us a sagittal dissection of a, of a cadaver. And again, you can see the, these are the, uh, the conche, the nasal conche over here, you can see, the superior, middle, and inferior. And then you can see the meatus, uh, the again, inferior, middle, and then superior, middle meatus uh, that are present. And uh, again, here's that uvula, and again, as food enters the mouth and it goes posterior. This is gonna get help push downwards. The pharynx is a funnel-shaped region that connects the nasal cavity and mouth superiorly to the larynx and esophagus inferiorly. Commonly, it's called the throat. The pharynx vaguely resembles a, a short length of a garden hose. As far as its length, we're looking at about 13 centimeters, which is about five inches, and it goes from the base of the skull down to about C6, so to the sixth cervical vertebra. From superior to inferior, the pharynx gets divided into three regions. We have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and finally, the laryngeopharynx. The nasopharynx is posterior to the nasal cavity, inferior to the sphenoid bone, and superior to the level of the soft palate. Because it lies above the point where food enters the body, it serves only as an ear passageway. The nasopharynx is continuous with the nasal cavity through the posterior nasal apertures. It's lined with pseudostratified ciliated epithelium and it takes over the job of propelling mucus where the nasal mucosa leaves off. During swallowing, the soft palate along with the uvula moves superiorly which closes off the nasopharynx and prevents food from entering the nasal cavity. So again, this is where it helps the food go down and into the esophagus. Again, that esophagus, that's your food tube. That's the tube that's gonna be connecting uh, to, it will be connected to your stomach. As we move along, high on its posterior wall, we find the pharyngeal tonsils. So. These are also called the adenoids, and they trap and destroy pathogens entering the nasopharynx from the air. So remember, these are your adenoids, A-D-E-N-O-I-D-S. Next, we have the pharyngotympanic tubes, which are also known as the auditory tubes. The auditory tubes drain the middle ear cavities and allow the middle ear pressure to equalize with the atmospheric pressure by opening up into the lateral walls of the nasopharynx. We find the oral pharynx lying posterior to the oral cavity and continuous through an arcway called the isthmus of the fossus, which is what we commonly call the throat. 
Because it extends inferiorly from the level of the soft palate to the epiglottis, foods and the liquid swallowed, as well as inhaled air, pass through it. It's made up of stratified squamous epithelium. So, if you recall from a few slides ago, we found pseudostratified columnar epithelium in the nasopharynx. Now, this transition from pseudostratified columnar epithelium to stratified squamous epithelium is, des is designed to allow for the increased friction in addition to the different chemical makeups that the foods that we eat or, or um, liquids that we drink. So, again, it could be acidic or hot and, and spicy foods that's going to be moving along this passage. As we move on, we find a pair of palatine tonsils that are embedded in the lateral walls of the oropharyngeal mucosa, just posterior to the oral cavity. Further along, as we continue, we get to the posterior surface of the tongue, and this is where we find the lingual tonsils. As we move on to the laryngopharynx, the laryngopharynx also serves as a passageway for food and air. Additionally, it also is lined with stratified squamous epithelium. We find it lying posterior to the larynx where the respiratory and digestive pathways divide. Additionally, it extends to the inferior edge of the cricord cartilage. Posteriorly, it's also continuous with the esophagus. Now, during swallowing, food has a right of way. An air passage temporarily stops as a flap of tissue called the epiglottis covers the entrance to the larynx. So as we continue over here, again, this is the region that we were speaking about in the, in the previous couple of slides. Here's the oropharynx again. This is a region that's behind the mouth. And then as you go below that, as you go inferior to this oropharynx, we find the laryngeopharynx. And we're going to be continuing to go downwards uh, into this region over here, uh, which is the, the, the larynx. And then as you go further down, further inferior, we go to the trachea. Here is this flap of tissue. This is that epiglottis. So when foods come, when food enters this region, this flap of tissue, this is going to come in and sit on top of this larynx and close this off. So now food or, or liquids, it has no choice but to go back over here into this direction. And this is that esophagus. This is the tube that's eventually going to be, eventually going to be connecting to the stomach. Okay, so this comes up, closes over here. So food and liquids then go this way. They cannot come down over here. So again, when your mom tells you that you shouldn't talk when you speak, this is the reason why. When you speak, this flap of tissue opens up. And if you're eating, there's a chance, or drinking something, there's a risk that either liquid or solids may end up coming and getting stuck over here or entering this. And if that happens, then we have a problem. Moving on to the lower respiratory system. Anatomically, the lower respiratory system consists of the larynx, trachea, the bronchi, and the lungs. Now, it gets broken into two zones. So functionally, the respiratory system is made up of the respiratory zone as well as the conducting zone. Let's take a look at this one first. The respiratory zone is the actual site of gas exchange. It consists of the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, the alveoli, and all the microscopic structures that go with it. The conducting zone consists of all the respiratory passageways from the nose all the way down deep into the respiratory bronchioles. These act as a fairly rigid conduit for air to reach the gas exchange sites. These conducting zone organs also cleanse, humidify, and warm the incoming air. This helps as the air jets reaching the lungs has fewer irritants like dust, bacteria, or anything else that could cause any irritation. The larynx is also commonly known as the voice box. It extends for about 5 centimeters, which is about 2 inches from the level of C3, all the way down to C6. Superiorly, it attaches to the hyoid bone and opens into the laryngopharynx. Inferiorly, it's continuous with the trachea. Now, the larynx has three main functions. The first is that it provides a patent, in other words, an open airway. Next is that it acts as a mediator to route air and food into the proper channel. So, food obviously is going to go into the esophagus, whereas air is going to go into the larynx. 
And last, it's also where voice prediction occurs, because it houses the vocal folds. The framework of the larynx is an arrangement of nine cartilages connected by membranes and ligaments. All the laryngeal cartilages consist of hyaline cartilages, with the exception of the epiglottis. The thyroid cartilage, which takes on a shield-like shape, is formed by the fusion of two cartilage plates at the midline. At the anterior midline of the neck, we can observe the laryngeal prominence, or more commonly known as the Adam's apple. The thyroid cartilage is typically larger in males than in females because the male sex hormone stimulates it to grow during puberty. Inferior to the thyroid cartilage is the ring-shaped cricoid cartilage, which is perched atop and anchored to the trachea inferiorly. Next, we have the three pair of small cartilages, the arytenoid, the cuneiform, and the corniculate cartilages. They form part of the lateral and posterior walls of the larynx. The most important of these would be the arytenoid cartilage, which anchors the vocal folds. Last, the ninth cartilage is the flexible epiglottis. The epiglottis is composed of elastic cartilage and is almost entirely covered by taste bud containing mucosa. It extends from the posterior aspect of the tongue to its anchoring point on the anterior rim of the thyroid cartilage. When only air is flowing into the larynx, the inlet to the larynx is wide open and the free edge of the epiglottis projects upwards. Now, during swallowing, the larynx gets pulled superiorly and the epiglottis tips over to cover the laryngeal inlet. This action keeps food out of the lower respiratory passageway. This is why we don't choke to death. Anything other than air entering the larynx initiates the cough reflex to expel the substance. So in this photograph over here, you can see this is the, the laryngeal prominence, right? in other words, your Adam's apple. And as you go superior to that, you'll have the body of the hyoid bone. You may be able to pal palpate. Um, when you go below or inferior to the laryngeal prominence, you end up coming down to the cricoid cartilage. So uh, below that, you have the, uh, the suprasternal notch. This is this uh, indentation that's there. And um, you know, when you go below that, you'll have the, the sternal head you can palpate. Of course, that's going to be for the manubrium. And what else? Are there? So they're showing the clavicle over here. So they're calling this the jugular knot. I believe it's also called the suprasternal notch. So there's two terms that, uh, uh, that are used to describe this this region and over here in this drawing and this is an anterior view of the larynx so once again over here uh, this is the your Adam's apple the laryngeal prominence as you go inferior to that you can see the cricothyroid ligaments over here and this is the cricoid cartilage and then you have the cricotracheal ligaments over here as we go below, you can see the, the rings of the, the tracheal cartilages. And um, if there is a posterior view, you'll see that these are actually C-shaped rings. Um, let's go back up over here. What else can we see? So here's the hyoid bone over here. And this is the, the thyroid membrane that you see here. And, and on the posterior aspect, you'll see over here, you have the epiglottis. Under the laryngeal mucosa on each side, we find the vocal ligaments which attach the arytenoid cartilage to the thyroid cartilage. These ligaments, which are largely made of elastic fiber, form the core of mucosal folds called the vocal folds, or another term that's used and it's more commonly heard, the true vocal cords. The vocal folds vibrate, producing sound as air is expelled from the lungs. The vocal folds and the medial opening between them through where air passes is called the glottis. Superior to the vocal folds is a similar pair of mucosal folds called the vestibular folds or the false vocal cords. They don't play a direct role in sound production, but they do help in closing the glottis when we swallow. When you look at the epithelium of the larynx, we find stratified squamous epithelium lining the superior portion of the larynx. Again, this area may be subjected to food contact, so we need something that's going to be a little bit more resilient in terms of tissue type. Now, once we go below the vocal folds, the epithelium transitions to a pseudostratified, ciliated columnar type that filters dust. The stroke of its cilia is directed upwards towards the pharynx to continually move mucus away from the lungs. 
We help move mucus up and out of the larynx when we clear out our throat. So here's a posterior review of the larynx. So you can see over here, this is, first of all, this is all, well, let's go back. This is the hiae bone. And here's the epiglottis. Here's the glottis over here. Uh, this over here, this are, these are the, uh, the corniculate cartilages over here. There is the, the um, arytenoid cartilage over here. Then as you come to the, uh, to the anterior part, we will see, I'm sorry, the posterior portion, we'll see the cricoid cartilage. Here are some tracheal cartilages, and you can see over here, again, there's cartilage here, there's cartilage there, but over here, there's not cartilage. So again, this is where we end up getting that C-shaped. So again, um, well, it's difficult to see over here, but uh, over here, you're going to find smooth muscle. Uh, within the, the tracheals is what you find over here. And uh, I believe, yeah, and here's the thyroid cartilage. I think that just about goes over everything for this uh, for this slide. So in this drawing, we have a sagittal section of the larynx. So if we start off, we have the epiglottis. As we move backwards, you can see this is a part of the, the hyoid bone, showing the body of the hyoid bone. As you go inferior, again, this is going to be where we have the, the cuneiform cartilage you can see over there. Here's the corniculate cartilage. And here's the cricoid cartilage over here. When you go inferior to that, we can see the tracheal, the tracheal rings or the tracheal cartilages that are present. And here's the cricotracheal ligament, and then this would be the cricothyroid ligament over here. Moving forward, and again, this is a this is a photograph. Actually, it's very nice. Here you can see the glottis, right? And on both sides of the the, the glottis. We end up having the, over here and over here, we have the, the vocal folds. These are the false vocal cords that you see over here, right? Superior to that, we have the epiglottis over here. And again, in this photograph, you can see also, this is the, uh, the epiglottis. So uh, in this photograph here, they're showing you where the vocal folds are in an open position, and here's where they are in a closed position. So when you look over here, you can see the, that's uh, the trachea over there. You can see these uh, C-shaped rings, actually, as it kind of goes downwards. Uh, and um, aside from that, what else are we able to, to visualize? So I, I think this, th this should be OK. Uh, so yeah. So these are the, your true vocal cords over here, okay, the vocal folds that we have over here. Okay, so you have your true, and then remember, these are the false uh, vocal folds over here, the false vocal cords. Looking at voice production, speech involves the intermittent release of expired air as the glottis opens and closes. The length of the vocal folds and the size of the glottis changes with the action of the laryngeal muscles that surrounds the cartilages. Now most of these muscles, they move the arytenoid cartilages. As the length and the tension of the vocal folds change, the pitch of the sound varies as well. Now, generally speaking, the tenser the vocal folds, the faster they vibrate and the higher the pitch. So if you look at a boy's larynx as it enlarges during puberty, his vocal folds are going to end up becoming longer and thicker because this causes them to vibrate more slowly and then it ends up causing his voice to become deeper. Now, loudness of the voice depends on the force with which the airstream rushes across the vocal folds. So the greater the force, the stronger the vibration, and the louder the sound. The muscles of the chest, our abdomen, as well as our, our back, they provide the power for that airstream. So next time if you're yelling or screaming, try to you know, consciously be aware of, of where all you're getting all this energy from push that, to force that air out. Now the perceived quality of the voice depends on the coordinated activity of many of the structures above the glottis. For example, the entire length of the pharynx acts as a resonating chamber that amplifies and enhances the sound quality. The oral, nasal, and sinus cavities also contribute to, to the vocal resonance. Additionally, good enunciation depends on the muscles in the pharynx, tongue, the soft palate, 
and the lips that shape sound into recognizable consonants and vowels. Now under certain conditions, the vocal folds act as a sphincter that prevents air passage. During abdominal straining associated with defecation, the glottis closes to prevent exhalation and the abdominal muscles contract. This causes the intra-abdominal pressure to go up. These events collectively are known as the Valsalva maneuver. Okay? So the Valsalva maneuver helps empty the rectum and can also help stabilize the body trunk when we're lifting heavy loads. The trachea, which is also known as the windpipe, descends from the larynx through the neck and into the mediastinum to the midthorax, terminating at its base called the corinna. At that point, it bifurcates into two main bronchi. Now, it's about 10 to 12 centimeters, which is about 4 inches in length, and at about 2 centimeters, or about 3 quarters of an inch, in diameter. It's also rather flexible and mobile. Structurally, it's made up of these C-shaped cartilage rings that give its property of resisting collapse. The walls of the trachea consist of three layers. We have the mucosa, the submucosa, and the adventitia, in addition to a layer of hyaline cartilage. The mucosa consists of ciliated pseudostratified epithelium. Its cilia continually push debris-laden mucus towards the pharynx where we either spit it out or swallow it into the digestive system. The submucosa is a connective tissue layer that's found deep to the mucosa. It contains serum mucus glands that help produce the mucus sheets within the trachea. It's supported by 16 to 20 C-shaped rings of hyaline cartilage that's wrapped by the outermost layer of connective tissue called the adventitia. On the open posterior aspect of the tracheal cartilage rings, we find them lying next to the esophagus, which are connected by smooth muscle fibers and soft connective tissue. The name of the smooth muscle is the tracheolus. The main function of the tracheolus muscle is to constrict the trachea, allowing air to be expelled with more force as when we cough, which helps in expelling mucus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the corinna marks the point where the trachea branches into the right and left bronchi. The mucosa of the corinna is highly sensitive. When a foreign object makes contact with it, violent coughing is triggered. So this is a cross-section of the trachea and the esophagus. So this is the anterior part and this is the posterior. So all this is the uh, trachea and this is the esophagus. This is the lumen or the lumen is like the, the open part where the air will pass through and the lumen uh, of the esophagus is over there. That's where food will pass through. So what do we have initially all the way over here? Here is, this is the, the adventitia over here. Behind that, posterior to that or deep to that, we end up having the hyaline cartilage. So these are the, the C-shaped rings. Okay. Deep to that, we end up having the, the seromucous glands in the, within the submucosa. So all this is submucosa. And then facing the lumen, we end up having our epithelial tissue over here. Okay. And you can see we have the muscle over here. So this part's open. And the open part, this is where we're going to find the tracheolus found. And then posterior to that, you can see we have the esophagus. Okay. So the next slide, again, this is a, uh, a photomicrograph of the tracheal wall. And again, you can see the epithelium over here. And again, you can see the goblet cells that are dispersed. They're going to be producing mucus. So remember, this is all pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Here is the lamina propria. This is the connective tissue layer. Below that, here is the submucosa. And you can see some of these serial um, mucus glands that you have over here within the submucosa. Here's another one over there. There's another one over there. And then below that, we have the hyaline cartilage which is making the, the, the C-shaped rings of the trachea. And this is a, um, a scanning electron micrograph of the cilia. So these guys, are, they're going to be beating upwards towards the pharynx. And whatever mucus is, is stuck on here, it's probably, it's captured dirt, debris, any irritant, anything that can get stuck on the mucus, it's going to get 
caught and then these guys end up pushing it upwards towards the throat. At that point, we either spit it out or we swallow it. All right, so um, smoking inhibits and ultimately, ultimately destroys the cilia. So when you smoke, all the toxins that are within the cigarette, they end up paralyzing these cilia, the, the ciliated cells, the cilia. So now the cilia are paralyzed, they're not able to move. They're not able to move, what ends up happening is that, let's go back over here. What ends up happening is the cilia are not able to move, and mucus is constantly being produced. So mucus, it just keeps on building up and up and up and up. And what ends up happening is the lumen of this trachea, it starts to get smaller and smaller. So as it starts to become smaller, this is when you start hearing the, whiz, uh, the, the hissing or the whistling sounds uh, of uh, these individuals. And again, uh, so the pro this is one of the problems, is that the cilia, they're not able to push up that mucus up into the throat anymore because they're paralyzed, again, because of the toxins that are within that, uh, the, the cigarette. And another, this is one of the other reasons why they end up coughing when they, you know, first thing in the morning. They're laying flat, and what ends up happening is when you go from a flat position to an upright position, all of that mucus slides down. Where does it slide down into? Well, where the only place it can go, deep, deeper into the, into the lung tissue. So at that point, again, your cough reflex go, you know, initiates, and then and they end up, having, uh, end up having violent coughing to push up that mucus up into the throat and out of the, uh, the lungs, out of the, the, the respiratory zones. And another thing that they have over here is, uh, so when you're choking, you know, something you can do is, is the Heimlich maneuver. So if there's any food that's stuck, uh, this is a very helpful and useful maneuver to learn. Essentially what you're doing is you're gonna be, um, you, you wrap your arms around the victim's abdomen. You're gonna go above superior to the, or at the level of the umbilicus, and then you wanna push in and upwards, so you thrust quickly almost at like an angle, but deep into the abdomen and up at the same time. And what you're doing is you're, you're crea increasing that, that pressure and hopefully that pressure, the, the intra-abdominal pressure, which ends up pushing air, that's gonna increase your thoracic pressure and also hopefully force whatever obstruction is there out of the, the airway, the trachea. All right, so let's move on to the bronchi and the subdivisions. So the air passageways in the lungs branch repeatedly about 23 times in a pattern that's often called the bronchial tree. Now at the terminal end of the bronchial tree, the conducting, zones, the conducting zone structures, they give way to the respiratory zone structures. Looking at the conducting zone structures, we can say that at about the level of T7, the trachea divides to form the right and left main bronchi. It can also be called the right and left primary bronchi. Uh, either or is, is, is acceptable. Each bronchus extends obliquely in the medial sign before it enters into the medial depression of its lung, which is called the hilum. The right main bronchus ends up being a little bit wider and shorter and more vertical than the left, so it's more common for inhaled foreign objects to get stuck there. Now before we go further, keep in mind that the right lung is slightly larger than the left, the right lung has three lobes, whereas the left lung has two lobes. Once inside the lungs, each main bronchus subdivides into secondary or lobar bronchi. We have three on the right and two on the left that each supply a single lung lobe. The secondary bronchi branch into third order segmental or tertiary bronchi. Now, the tertiary divide repeatedly into smaller and smaller bronchi. So we end up getting fourth order, fifth order, et cetera, et cetera. Now when these passages get smaller than one millimeter in diameter, they get called bronchioles, which literally trans translates into small bronchi. So if you look at this term O-L-E, O-L-E means small. It's a suffix for small, so small bronchi. The smalls of these terminal bronchioles are less than a, a half a millimeter in diameter. And this is where the end of the, of the conducting zone occurs.
So when you look at this photograph here, what do we see? So this is going to be your right lung, and here is your left lung. So uh, again, we're looking at the anterior surface. So this is the superior lobe. We have the middle lobe, and then you have the inferior lobe. Now, this is going to be the apex, and this is going to be the base. So again, you have the apex over here, and this is the base, the inferior. Um, so again, the left uh, lung over here, notice there's only two lobes. You have this inferior lobe, and we have a superior. Whereas on the right side, we have a superior lobe, we have a middle lobe, and then we we'll also have the inferior lobe that's present. So let's move along, and then also you can see these, uh, all right, so here we got the trachea, and then you have the, the primary bronchus, and off the primary, so again, you have the main one, right? This is, well, let's go back. Here's the primary or the main bronchus. Off that, then you have the, the lobar, these are the secondary. Off the secondary, then we have the segmental, okay? So the segmental, again, you can also call them the tertiary. And then as you go, these will start to get smaller and smaller. And then we'll, there should be other photographs to show you where, what they look like when they get, you know, at, at different orders, when they start getting very small. So there should, we should have drawings of the, uh, the, uh, the bronchioles as well, and the terminal bronchioles, et cetera. So as the tubes of the conducting zone become smaller, the following structural changes occur. We start to see irregular patches or plates of cartilage replace the cartilage rings. By the time we reach the bronchioles, we don't find supportive cartilage in the tube walls at all. They do, however, contain elastic fibers throughout the bronchial tree. The mucosal epithelium, it starts to thin as it changes from pseudostratified columnar to simple columnar and then just to simple cuboidal in the terminal bronchioles. The mucus producing cells and cilia, they become less prevalent in the bronchioles. So from this point down, debris that's found, it has to be removed by macrophages within the alveoli. The amount of smooth muscle in the tube walls increases as the passageways become smaller. A complete layer of circular smooth muscle in the bronchioles and the lack of supporting cartilage allows the bronchioles to provide a significant amount of resistance to air passage under specific conditions. Moving on to the respiratory zone structures. The respiratory zone begins as the terminal bronchioles feed into the respiratory bronchioles within the lung. The respiratory bronchioles lead into the alveolar ducts, which connect to the alveoli, which are clustered into groups that we call alveolar sacs or alveolar saccules. So they kind of look like grapes, like a stalk of grapes. Now, the alveolar duct walls are made up of smooth muscle rings and connective tissue. Our lungs, they're made up of about 300 million alveoli, which account for most of our lung volume, which provides a huge surface area for gas exchange to take place. Moving along, so this is what we're looking at. Here is the termium bronchioles. Now you can see the smooth muscles that's uh, wrapped around around these. So as you go from terminal bronchiole, now we're going to the respiratory bronchioles. So what do we have? These are the alveolar ducts. And you can see these alveolar ducts. They're surrounded by individual alveoli. So when you're talking about cluster th clusters th of these, this is what we end up referring to as the, the sacs. So uh, yes. And if they kind of look like, again, if you think about it, this is what, uh, kind of like how grapes look like when you go by them. So once again, we have the terminal bronchiole over here. From the terminal bronchiole, we end up going to the respiratory bronchioles. The respiratory bronchioles, they connect to the alveolar ducts. And then we have the alveoli. And then when you look at groups of them, we call these the alveolar sacs. And here is another, this is a, a cross section is kind of showing you. This is what they look like. They're, you know, they're, they're hollow spaces inside. And you can see the duct over here. And then you have the pores. So moving down into the respiratory membrane. The respiratory membranes consist of the pulmonary capillaries and the alveolar walls along with their fused membranes. In addition to being surrounded by a basement membrane, 
The wall of the alveoli are made up of primarily a single layer of squamous epithelial cells called type 1 alveolar cells. The external surface of the alveoli are covered densely of pulmonary capillaries. This resulting blood air barrier has blood flowing past on one side and gas on the other side. Gas exchange occurs by simple diffusion across the respiratory membrane with oxygen passing from the alveolus into the blood and carbon dioxide leaving the blood and entering into the alveolus. So the other type of cell we find are the type 2 alveolar cells. These are cuboidal epithelial cells that we find scattered among the type 1 cells. They secrete a fluid containing a substance we call surfactant. They also secrete a number of antimicrobial proteins that are important elements of innate immunity. So when you look over here, what do we have? These are the, the pulmonary capillaries, and you can see they're very heavily uh, surrounded uh, on the outside of the, the alveoli. So again, over here you got blood flow taking place, and inside these spaces are filled with, uh, with gases. So again, uh, across this mem the respiratory membrane, we end up having the exchange of gases taking place between these structures and the blood vessels and of course blood inside and here's a scanning electron uh, micrograph of a, a pulmonary uh, capillary and again here's some more uh, this is another photograph over here that shows you so here's um, a red blood cell that you that's found within the capillary here's another one over here and over here within the alveolus you can see the different type of cells we have so again, if you kind of zoom in over here into this photograph, what they're showing you is that here is a red blood cell and we're having this red blood cell uh, taking up oxygen from the alveolus and it's releasing the carbon dioxide. Remember, diffusion occurs from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So oxygen is going to be less concentrated in blood, so therefore it's going to be higher in the, of course, if the person is breathing properly, it will be higher in the alveolus. So oxygen will diffuse from the alveolus where its concentration is high to where it is low in that being in the red blood cell. And then carbon dioxide concentration is going to be much higher in blood than it is in going to be in the alveolus. So therefore it will leave blood. Again, this happens just by principles of diffusion. When you start looking at the alveolus, here you can see these type 1 cells which are in purple you can see some of these macrophages also, which are the blue guys. And then here is the, the type 2 cells that are in, in green. These are the, the cells that are producing the uh, surfactant. These are all the green cells. So looking at the gross anatomy of the lungs, the lungs occupy all the thoracic cavity except for the mediastinum, which houses the heart, the great blood vessels, bronchi, esophagus, and some other organs. Now, when we look at our lungs, they take on the form of a cone-shaped structure. Each one of these organs gets surrounded by the pleura and connects to the mediastinum by vascular and bronchial attachments that are collectively called the lung root. The anterior, posterior, and lateral surfaces of the lung lie in close contact with the ribs and form what we call to be the costal surface. The narrow superior tip of the lung, which is found deep to the clavicle, is termed the apex, and the concave inferior surface that sits on the diaphragm is called the base. On the medial sinal surface of each lung, we find an indentation called the hilum, and it's through the hilum which the pulmonary and systemic blood vessels, the bronchi, lymphatic vessels, and the nerves enter and exit the lungs. Now, because the apex of the heart is slightly left of the median plane, the two lungs, they vary slightly in shape and size. The left lung is a little bit smaller than the right, it has a concavity on its medial aspect that accommodates the apex of the heart. It's subdivided into the superior and inferior lobes by the oblique fissure. The right lung gets separated into a superior, middle, and inferior lobes, which are separated by the oblique and horizontal fissures. All right, so when you look over here, this is the topmost part of the lung. This is the apex, and if you look at it, the apex of the lungs, it extends slightly above the clavicle. Over here, we have the thymus gland, that's your trachea, 
And as we go down now, this is, uh, keep in mind, this is the right side and this is the left side. So again, you can see the apex of the heart is right about here. And here's that indentation of the, the left lung, which accommodates room for the heart. So again, here's this oblique fissure and you can see the oblique fissure separating the left lung into uh, a superior and inferior lobe. Now let's move to the other side. On the right side, we have the right superior lobe, the right middle lobe, and then we have the right inferior lobe. The oblique fissure over here is gonna separate the middle from the inferior lobe, and then the horizontal fissure will separate the superior lobe from the middle lobe. Uh, here's the, the diaphragm over here. Remember, the diaphragm is the muscle, it's a skeletal muscle that helps us breathe. This is the main breathing muscle that we have. Then of course you have your uh, external and intercostal muscles that also assist with, uh, with respiration. Uh, in addition to that, so again, remember, this is the base of the lung, okay? So the base is sitting, again, and you can see that this is concave, and again, this is more pointy, so this is the apex. And so um, the other thing is, remember, this part over here, this indentation that accommodates for the heart, is called the cardiac notch. So moving along, all right, so here's a, a photograph of the a medial view of the left lung. So clearly you can see over here, here's this oblique fissure. So this is gonna be the superior lobe and then we have the inferior lobe below that. Here's the hilum, and you can see the pulmonary vein and that this is the pulmonary artery over here. This is gonna be your primary bronchus, or again, your main bronchus, the left primary or the left main bronchus. Um, the other thing you can see over here is the, the impression of the aorta. So you know, this is called the aortic impression. Um, aside from that, again, you can see the, the base over here, and once again, the apex of the left lung right over here. So we have a drawing over here of a transverse section through the thorax. Here's the anterior, this is the posterior, this is one of the thoracic vertebras, and then we have the, the sternum over here. Here's your lungs on both sides, and you can see the lung is surrounded by this pleura. Okay, so you have the pleural cavity over here. So there's a parietal pleura, and then this is the this will be the visceral pleura. And between that, you have the space, the, 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 uh, the pleural cavity. And over here, within the pleural cavity, we have uh, fluid. So this is gonna be, uh, this fluid essentially, it decreases the amount of friction as the lungs expand and, uh, and contract. Aside from that, what else? We can see the esophagus over here, and over here, we have the pulmonary trunk, all right? So the pulmonary trunk, it's going, it's leading uh, to these pulmonary capillaries, which are gonna be found over here. And uh, what else can we look at? So yeah, it, you have your heart over here that you can see. Uh, aside from that, this is gonna be the, the membrane that surrounds the heart, so this is the, the pericardial membrane. And so this region over here, this is what we refer to as, as the, the mediastinum, okay? So this is within the mediastinum over here. So moving along to the next slide, we have, um, all right, so continuing with the gross anat anatomy of the lung. Now, each lobe gets further divided into a number of pyramid-shaped bronchiopulmonary segments. They're separated from one another by connective tissue. The right lung has 10 of these bronchiopulmonary segments, but the left lung, it could vary anywhere from eight to 10 segments. So each one of these segments gets served by its own artery and vein, and it also gets its ear supply from an individual tertiary bronchus. Clinically, this is important because pulmonary disease is usually constrained to one or a few of these segments. The connective tissue portion of the segment allows the disease segment to be surgically removed without damaging any of the neighboring segments or impairing their blood supply. The smallest subdivisions of the lungs that we're able to see with our eyes unaided are the lobules. Lobules appear at the lung surface as hexagon-shaped structures, and they range in size from about the size of a pencil eraser to nearly 20 millimeters, which is about the size of a penny. One large bronchiole and its branches serve each lobule. So when you look at the lobules of urbanites and in smokers, the connective tissue that separates the individual lobules can be seen blackened with carbon. Lungs mostly consist of the alveoli. Again, this is the air spaces that are there. The remainder of the lung tissue, or its stroma, is mostly elastic connective tissue. Because of this, the lungs are soft, spongy, elastic organs 
that together they weigh just about over one kilogram. So that's about 2.2 pounds. Uh, the elasticity of the, a healthy lung, it reduces the work of breathing. So, you know, when this elasticity decreases, this is when you start having lung problems. And in this photograph over here, we can see the bronchiopulmonary segments. So as we said earlier, the right uh, lung will have about 10 of these. So if you look over here, here's one, two, three, four, let's go back, five, and then you got the two in the middle lobe here, and then the upper, the right superior lobe, end up having three. So this makes a total of 10. Now let's go to the left side. Now remember, on the left side, it can vary anywhere from eight to 10 segments. So in this photograph over here, we've got five over here in the inferior lobe, one, two, three, four, five, and then we have four over here on, in the superior lobe. So we have a total of nine. So the lungs are perfused by two circulations. There's pulmonary circulation and also there's bronchial circulation. For pulmonary circulation, systemic venous blood that needs to be oxygenated in the lungs gets delivered by the pulmonary arteries, which we find lying anterior to the main bronchi. In terms of pressure and volume, we find the pulmonary circuit to be low pressure, high volume circulation. Now, because all of the body's blood passes through the lungs about once every minute, the lung capillary endothelium is an ideal location for enzymes to interact with blood substances. So, for example, ACE, which stands for angiotensin converting enzyme, activates an important blood pressure hormone. Another enzyme inactivates certain prostaglandins. Now, as for bronchial circulation, the bronchial arteries provide oxygenated systemic blood to the lung tissue. They rise from the aorta, enter the lungs at the hilum, and then run along the branching bronchi. They provide a high pressure, low volume supply of oxygenated blood to all the lung tissue except the alveoli. The tiny bronchial veins drain some systemic venous blood from the lungs, but there are multiple anastomoses between the two circulations and most venous blood returns to the heart via the pulmonary veins. In terms of innervation of the lungs, the lungs are innervated by both parasympathetic and sympathetic motor fibers in addition to visceral sensory fibers. These nerve fibers enter each lung through the pulmonary plexus on the lung root and run along the bronchial tubes and blood vessels in the lungs. Parasympathetic fibers cause the ear tubes to constrict, whereas the sympathetic fibers dilate them. The pleura form a thin double-layered serosa. The layer called the parietal pleura covers the thoracic wall and superior face of the diaphragm. From there, it continues around the heart and between the lungs, forming the lateral walls of the mediastinal enclosure and snugly enclosing the lung root. From here, the pleura extends as a layer called the visceral pleura, which covers the external lung surface. The pleura produces a fluid called the pleural fluid, which fills the slit-like pleural cavity between them. This lubricating secretion allows the lungs to glide easily over the thoracic wall during the movements that occur in breathing. So in this uh, diagram over here, which you looked at earlier, so we're just going to revisit what, uh, I think I already mentioned this in the, in the previous slide. So what do we have over here is the parietal pleura, okay, and which is making contact with the thoracic wall. And then we have the visceral pleura, which is making contact with the lungs. And then we have this space over here in between. So again, you can kind of see this, this space over here. And this is the pleural cavity. So it's within the space we have this pleural fluid. So again, as you're breathing, and again, the lungs are um, dilating and constricting, dilating and constr uh, constricting, that's friction. So this fluid, it reduces that friction. So that's it for this, uh, the first part of this, of this chapter. If you have any questions, p please feel free to email me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you again for watching.